Hello everyone and welcome back to One Soccer. I am your host for today, Josh Deming, and we are back with another episode of our Canadians Abroad Summer Series. Now the last few days for us national team supporters have been crazy. There's been a lot of storylines, a lot of ongoing storylines as well, with the Canadians national team having their match against Panama postponed, they went on strike, they've returned to training now, we're going to break it down, we've got a lot of other stories is coming on as well, we have a few guests who are featuring today, Alex Gange Ruznik is coming back on as along with Thomas Neff, and we also are going to hear from Oliver Platt on the Canadian Championship, so hopefully you guys are excited for this episode, and if you are, be sure to drop a like, drop a sub, and let's get into it now. We are going to kick things off with the biggest talking points surrounding Canadian soccer in the last few days, and that is the fact that the Canadian men's national team have cancelled yet another friendly, this time cancelling their match against Panama. There's a lot to take away from the cancellation, and we're going to take a look at the fans' perspective first. There was so much uncertainty leading up to this match that fans arrived to the stadium only to find out that the match was cancelled a couple hours ahead of kickoff. We had a supporter take their story to Twitter and talked about the fact that they bought nine tickets for the original match against Iran, only to have that match cancelled and then had to buy seven additional tickets to attend the Panama match, which again got cancelled. There's numerous other stories about fans losing money on flights, hotel rooms, taxis, ferries, and everything in between. The next point from this story is the fact that the Canadian men's national team players protested the match and released a statement to Rick Westhead of TSN calling for a number of changes, including more transparency on Canada Soccer's business operations, they want to see more former national team players in leadership positions, they want a favorable compensation structure for the World Cup bonuses, and equity payments between the Canadian men's national team and the Canadian women's national team programs. There were numerous storylines coming out from the Canadian men's national team cancelling their match against Panama. There were some numbers that were going out. The original reported numbers turned out to not be 100% accurate, but there was a late twist in it when the Canadian women's national team put their own statement on Twitter. The Canadian women's national team wanted to clarify that they will not accept an agreement that does not offer equal pay, a distinction from an equal FIFA percentages. They wanted to be clear on that. They also stated that they saw Canada Soccer's first tabled proposal as being a positive step towards pay equity between the two programs. As One Soccer reported in our breakdown of the story, the roughly 10 million in World Cup bonuses is a key issue between the two parties. But Canada Soccer's president, Dr. Nick Bontis, had this to say about the men's team's written request. If we as an association only had the men's team and the women's team to take care of and nothing else. No futsal, no beach, no para, no U20, no U17, no U15 on both sides. No coaching development programs, no referee development programs, no national championships. We could still not afford this proposal. It is untenable as written. Obviously, this is still a very complicated and messy situation that hurts fans first and foremost. No footballer ever wants to cancel a match, and we hope that all parties involved find a good solution. Progress was made, however, as negotiations carried on Sunday night. Nick Bont has ended up leaving Vancouver the following day, and the Canadian men's national team released this letter. Dear Canada, We, the Canadian men's national team, have decided to resume training in preparation for the road to Qatar. To be clear, we have not reached an agreement with the Canadian Soccer Association, the players have met with the senior leaders of Canada Soccer on Sunday evening and will continue to negotiate the process, but questions have yet to be answered and actions have yet to be taken. We move forward in hopes that Canada Soccer will work with us to resolve the situation. The Canadian men's national team, we are brothers, we fear nothing, we stand on guard. Having already seen two families get cancelled, the ramifications of forfeiting two more competitive matches could have been pretty dire on Canada Soccer. It's a very good step towards finding a resolution here and seeing our Canadian men's national team hopefully back in action against Curaçao on Thursday. It was said that the Canadian Soccer Association moved mountains to be able to replace the Iran friendly with the Panama friendly. In the end, both were cancelled and we're going to take a look at how the Panamanian camp is feeling, how their coach is feeling, and here's Thomas Neff to break it down. Thank you, Josh. What we know in Panama is this. The manager of the national team, Thomas Christensen, told Matthew Shinetti of TSN that, quote, He's seen games not played due to bad weather, but nothing quite like this before, both in his time as a player and a coach. He also confirmed that Panama was paid what was promised to them by Canada Soccer, which is around the same reported amount that Iran was expected to be paid of 400,000 
$1,500 KUS dollars. Panama was paid a little less than that to make the long trip to Vancouver in midst of their own Nations League qualifying matches themselves. The truth is, unlike Iran, in the reaction from the Panamanian Federation has been normal. Besides Christensen, no other players or executives have spoken on this very subject. And according to journalists of TV rights holder RPC Deportes, Christensen felt, quote, he couldn't believe it. This was unexpected, but there is no problem. And this is CONCACAF, end quote. Uh, they also put out a press release on social media saying that they trained Sunday night at BC Place and traveled back to Panama that same evening. Basically mentioned that their sole focus was playing CONCACAF Nations League matches versus Martinique, uh, both home and away legs, after beating uh, Costa Rica uh, 2 nothing. Now, the response from the Panamanian media, Panamanian media has not been too kind. Uh, they characterized Canada as a, as a top 10 global economy, first world country. And according to TV, Next, Next TV, uh, they are in diapers. Compare Canada to developing countries where things like this uh, happen, end quote. Uh, they believe they wasted their time uh, preparing for a new cycle in 2026. And it was believed around a thousand fans from Panama, a little less than that, were expected to be in attendance at BC Place uh, supporting Panama. Uh, statistics reporting from 2016 says that 4,700 Panamanians live in Canada, and a lot of them were expected to be making the trip uh, from the U.S. as well. Uh, fans took to Twitter, not lightly. Uh, they called this decision by Canada a joke, a trick, and asked them to be sanctioned as well, and they cannot be trusted uh, in the future. Uh, that is everything that we have been able to find out about them uh, with Panama. Taking a step away from the Canadian men's national team, we have a player whose future is still up in the air, and that player is Kyle Lahren. The all-time Canadian men's national team leading goal scorer is without a club right now. It's been confirmed that he is not going to re-sign with Besiktas. There has been some interest with Istanbul, Besiktas, and Galatasaray to stay in Turkey. There's also been recent reports coming out with a move to potentially Nottingham Forest, as well as Galatasaray. With more information, here's Alex Gonge Ruzik. The Kyle Lahren situation remains fluid and ongoing, as we know. Uh, what we do know is he's a free agent this summer, and because of that, there's interest in, in Kyle Lahren. Uh, because despite what's gone on this past season, only scored seven goals in all competitions due to injuries, form, international duty, Besiktas firing a Sergeant Yelchin. Uh, you know, going with interim owner Carvalli and then bringing in Valerian Ishmael right at the end. So three different coaches. Uh, it was a far cry from uh, the 2020-2021 season when uh, Kyle Lahren scored 19 Super League goals, 23 in all competitions, to go to seven all competitions. It's a, it's a stark cry, but uh, it kind of shows where things went this year. But that doesn't mean that there isn't interest in Kyle Lahren. We've kind of seen it over the last year. League uh, clubs, Premier League clubs, clubs within Turkey, all interested in him. And I think these latest reports with Olympiacos, uh, with uh, Nottingham Forest, you know, it makes sense to, to, to see those sorts of links because you see where what Laren has produced, what Laren has done with a very good club in Besiktas in a solid league in, in Turkey. You know, clubs in similar leagues like Olympiacos with Greece, uh, you know, some of the other top Turkish clubs, of course, they'll be interested, and then it was interesting to see the top five links in terms of, you know, French clubs taking a look at him, English clubs. I mean, the English ones in particular, those links have been there for a while. I, you know, in 2019, Leeds United, you know, we're, we're interested West Ham, uh, all these sorts of English clubs over the last three years, but ever since he was uh, with Zulta Wargame in the Belgian division on loan back a couple seasons ago. You know, he has the physical makeup, he has the, the technical ability to play, uh, you know, in all sorts of leagues, but especially, you know, in England where they value the physical component and they see what he's able to, to do. Because of that, I see the Forest links and inter immediately get interested by the prospect of playing in the Premier League with a fellow Canadian, you might, you know, it's important to add with uh, Richie Larea. So overall, I think with Kyle Laird, I think there's going to be a lot of links given that he's a solid striker, an international what he's able to produce. He's multi-positional. He can play out wide, as we saw with Besiktas. He is more of a second forward at his best, but he can you know, lead the line if needed, can play as part of a two, uh, etc. And that sort of versatility along with his size, his ability to both create and score, 
uh, teams will be looking at him. So I'm not surprised to see teams like uh, Forest and, and, and Olympiacos. And there's many more. I mean, Liga clubs, uh, teams in Turkey. It's going to be a, a very interesting race for his signature, given that he's on a free. It's not often that you see you know, young forwards who can score goals. And, you know, young in the sense that he's still mid to late 20s. It's still a very good age for someone like him who isn't necessarily over reliant on speed or other physical skills. I think this would uh, it makes no you know it makes a lot of sense. Sorry for for clubs to to be interested. And I think that's why we're seeing these reports. We jumped in a hot tub time machine and went back to 2020 to the Canadian Championship final that never took place between Forge FC and Toronto FC. That final did take place on Saturday, and it was an incredible final. There wasn't a Concacaf Champions League place on the line, but there was pride of Ontario as well as some silverware. We brought on Oliver Platt to help us break it down. This final was two years in the making. It was supposed to take place in 2020. It was finally taking place in 2022. Forge FC took on Toronto FC, and it was an incredible match. So, Ollie, I got to ask you, is Forge a little hard done by? Did they deserve to win that final? Yeah, I think they did. I think it was it was much like last year's semifinal against Montreal, right? I, I thought Forge played an outstanding game. Um, the difference this time was... That whereas Montreal made a lot of changes to their team in, in that game last season, this was this was the best TFC have to offer, albeit with with some absences and with forced absences like like Jonathan Azorio. So that made the performance even more impressive, even though we we know Montreal is is a stronger team than, than Toronto right now. Um, but I think having seen the other Montreal Forge game, this year's Montreal Forge game a couple of weeks earlier. And the fact that Forge didn't really look like they were, they were particularly close in that match. And we know that Forge are going through a bit of transition right now. A lot of defensive injuries, some changes to, to the roster in the offseason. Um, I, I didn't expect that kind of performance from, from Forge. I know that Bobby Simoniotis' team is capable of that at their best. But I just didn't know if we would get the best version of Forge at, at this stage in, in the team's development. So to see them play like that, to take the game to TFC... You know, a team that you, you can say whatever you want about where they're at right now, but it's still a team that's spending many, many millions more than, than Forge are, obviously. Um, to see them, you know, just just play the game on their terms, play the Forge way and, and impose themselves again, like we've seen them do so often in some difficult circumstances in Central America against MLS teams and so on and so forth. Um, I thought it was another really impressive day for Forge and, and one that I think is, is a big building block for them going forwards. And Toronto got it over the line in the end, and like you mentioned, it's there's there's no getting around the fact that they were able to bring it home. This has to do a little bit of something to this team, but on the flip side, of, it's a crushing loss for Forge. And after such an incredible match, the atmosphere was incredible. Tim Hortons Field was absolutely bumping. Just how good of a job did Forge FC do showing everyone watching, especially at the MLS club, just how good the CPL is? Yeah, it was great to see. It, it, it was great to see, you know, a, a Canadian Championship final played in, in a new stadium like Tim Hortons Field, new atmosphere, different fan base of obviously leading things. Um, and it's just, I, I, I've always said, I, I think, you know, some people think that we're, we're too kind to Forge and we give them too much praise and, and credit and so on. But I think they are the club unavoidably that has set the bar for everyone else in the Canadian Premier League. And so when, when you're looking at, you know, I, I, I know for a fact from, from talking to, to Pamadu Kar and the people at Pacific over the last couple of years that Forge were the, the goal for them. We have to get to that level. We have to aspire to be as good as them and then to beat them. And, and they did it, right? And I think the the fact that Forge have set that standard and it's, that it's been a really good standard, uh, probably better than a lot of people could have expected in, in the first couple of years of, of CPL history, I, I think has kind of made everyone else around them better. And, and now you're seeing it this year as well with what Atletico Ottawa are doing. You know, they were a team that was miles off last year, um, didn't have the season they wanted to have at all. But there's real intent at that club. They expect to win, they expect to compete, and they know if that, that if they're going to compete and, and going to win a North Star Shields, Forge is one of the teams and probably the team that you still look at that you have to, to match and, and be better than. And that's a very, very difficult thing to do that takes, you know, it takes investment from a club, it takes effort, good coaching, good management. Um, the right kind of mentality in the locker room and, and they're starting to build that now so I, I think it's been a good thing for the league that we've had one team that through the first couple of years certainly um, was the outstanding team in the league continues to set the standard i think in a lot of different ways on and off the pitch and, and makes everyone around them better forces everyone around them to be better quite frankly and and, and that's making the league a, a stronger place as a whole james pierce of the athletic is reporting that liverpool are still interested in jonathan david Jonathan David, like Kyle Lahren's future, is a little uncertain. 
There's been numerous clubs linked with Jonathan David over the last 12 months, and Liverpool has always been a club that is sniffing around and has been a part of the equation. It's worth noting that there are heavy reports that Sadio Mane is going to leave Liverpool and sign for Bayern Munich, which is going to open up a position in that front three. Now, if Jonathan David was to fit into a starting 11 at Liverpool, it will more than likely be through the middle of the front three with a player like Luis Diaz on one side and Mohamed Salah on the other side. This is a massive opportunity for Jonathan David. He is looking for a way out of Lille. And if you can get interest from a club like Liverpool, hopefully you can find a way to get it done because that front three with Jonathan David, Mohamed Salah and Luis Diaz could be very scary for the Premier League opposition next season. We have some news coming out of the Canadian Premier League that Eason Ongaro was spotted training with FC Edmonton. He had an incredible spell with FC Edmonton, scoring 25 goals in 55 appearances, which got him a move to Uttarad in Romania. His spell with Uttarad was not overly successful as he only had six appearances, scoring one goal. FC Edmonton have had a disastrous start to the season so far, playing 10 matches, having zero wins, four draws, six points, and are dead last in the table with a negative 11 goal differential with only four points, five points ahead of seventh place York United. Having a player of Easton Ongaro's quality returning to the Canadian Premier League is fantastic for the league, but also fantastic for a team who desperately needs a spark. They need to find an opportunity to get that first win, find a little bit of cohesion with the side, and start pushing for a playoff position. Nichelle Prince made some history over the weekend, becoming the very first player to ever score a hat-trick for the Houston Dash. She took all three of her goals very well, but that third one was something special. Swinging her left boot at it, curling over the keeper, looping in the back of the net. It was an incredible way to cap off an incredible performance for Prince as well as Houston Dash as they went on five nothing winners in an incredible game. Big shout out to Nichelle Prince. There were some big storylines surrounding Canadian soccer this week, but the biggest one that we're going to keep an eye on is whether indeed the Canadian men's national team play their matches against Curacao and Honduras. We will keep you guys completely up to date here on One Soccer, but that brings us to an end of this edition of Canadians Abroad Summer Series. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it, and if you did, as always, be sure to drop a like, drop a sub as well, because we're getting very close to 50,000 subscribers. So if you want to help us reach our goal, dropping a sub will definitely do that. Also, be sure to subscribe over to One Soccer for all things Canadian soccer content, the best place to get that type of coverage. Thank you guys so much for watching, and until next time, guys, take care and cheers, friends.